Hi everyone, it's Adam here from DNF1. Just before we begin the podcast, I wanted to quickly share with you some exciting news. For this month, the DNF1 podcast is proudly sponsored by... Manscaped. For the entire month of March, you can get hold of some great Manscaped products like this and plenty more other great products on their website for 20% off and free shipping. Oh my God! Wow! All you have to do is head over to manscaped.com and use our promo code DNF1 to receive 20% off your order and also free shipping too. We loved using Manscaped products and we know that you will too. So make sure to get yours now. Trust us, your balls will thank you. So hello there and welcome to a brand new episode of the DNF1 F1 podcast, the show where we cover all of the latest news, gossip and rumours in the Formula One world for your listening and viewing pleasure, depending on what platform you choose to follow us on. Um, And first of all, of course, guys, it is the big one. The new Mercedes, the W12 has finally broken cover. And in this episode, guys, we are going to review what we think of the car. Do we like the look of it? And of course, any technical secrets that we could sort of unveil or perhaps not unveil for to see if Mercedes can make it eight championships in a row, which has never been done in Formula One before. And Mercedes, of course, breaking records all the time. I'm sure many people wouldn't bet against them achieving that feat. But of course, first things first, guys. If you haven't already seen uh, the advert beforehand or not, we are being sponsored by Manscaped for the entire month of March. Manscaped, a uh, grooming company, provided us, provided us with some stuff to test out and is absolutely brilliant products that they have. I definitely recommend you guys to go out and get some for yourself. It could be a great gift for yourself, a partner, or perhaps a friend of yours that's been a little bit lazy or comfortable in lockdown and perhaps needs to tidy themselves up a little bit definitely go to Manscaped, use the code DNF1, and that will give you 20% off and free shipping on your order. So make sure to go to manscaped.com. Now, guys, of course, the Mercedes, we've got to talk about that, the real big one, the one we've been looking forward to seeing since the end of last season. And of course, I am joined once again by my co-host, Mr. Courtney Pine, donning his Mercedes shirt appropriately this evening and uh, of course also joining me once again who's reviewed a few cars of us is lee lee i'm going to come to you first how excited are you about this one this was the real big one you've been telling me that you've been looking forward to seeing well firstly before that i just want to say corny your partiality is really a uh, <laughs> <on pilot. laughs> um, can't be representing in the team mate yeah <laughs> um no the, the, the car itself it's Really looking forward to seeing that car on track. But obviously, it's there. As you said before, Mercedes have kept the cars close to the chest. Um, you're not, they're not giving any indicator from the, the released images regarding the floor, what the floor may look like. The Obviously, the rear of the car and the winglets, the front of the car. It's uh, interesting and in how they're playing almost Red Bullish and how they're keeping their cards close to their chest a little bit and um red bull of course let's not forget they had that shakedown run at uh, silverstone where we we were able to learn a lot more about the car uh than we originally did during the launch but um well obviously we'll get to the technical stuff in the moment um first things first guys what do you make of the new livery are you a fan of course it has changed in certain aspects, more notably at the rear of the car than at the front but of course as we expected mercedes maintain the black uh, livery that they donned last season in support of the Black Lives Matter movement anti-racism campaign which has been very effective from Mercedes part always championing diversity and doing more in collaboration with Lewis Hamilton such an important cause and you know long may they continue to fight that and eradicate that hopefully one day but other than that guys what do you think of the livery do you enjoy this year's one or perhaps not as much as last year's uh, Courtney I'll come to you first on that one um, I've noticed uh, quite a few complaints about the uh, the silver part towards the, uh, the rear of the car with the AMG logos. Um, I like it, and personally, I'm happy that they've gone with something a little bit different this season because my biggest gripe with the car reveals this season is that they're pretty much B-spec cars. Yeah, there isn't really any noticeable differences on the majority of these cars, or they're higher than them at this point. So it's nice that some of these some of these teams are freshening up liveries to give us something to look forward to because usually at the start of the season we start off at Melbourne 
And I love seeing the brand new cars going around that fast flowing track. And we're going to be missing out on that this season. So it's nice that some of the teams have given us at least something different to look forward to. And uh, what about you, Lee? Are you a fan of the new Mercedes livery? Well, I'll probably be one of those people complaining about the AMG um, logos and silver at rear of the car. Um, I personally, I'm sure it's on there somewhere, but I can't see the Nicky Lauda red Mercedes star. It is there. Uh, it is there. It's. I think. Yeah, it's, I'm um, sure it is there because they said it'd be on all their cars. But yeah, last year's car, you could really spot the red Mercedes yeah. star out of all the white Mercedes star at the rear of the car. Obviously, they changed their livery, which is a uh, livery. Sorry, which is, uh, is as Courtney said, it's it's nice to have a change. But yeah, I'm not a fan of that change. Um, and regarding Nicky Lauda star. Um, I would like to think it's somewhere nice and prominent and can be seen easily. But as I said, from the images released, I haven't been able to locate it yet. I think it's under the... Um, so, oh, what, oh, oh, my mind's gone blank now. It's... it's um, Oh, God, my mind has gone completely blank. And red. No, <laughs> it is it's situated under... You know where the Ineos logo is at the top of the car? Yeah. Um, it is, but yeah, it's basically underneath there. So it okay, is. Okay, I haven't seen. I'll um, go back and have a look. I'll, 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 I'll have to, to check yeah. this out and see if you're right, Adam. Go and see this. I'm just looking at the photos now, but it is definitely on the car. I can assure you guys, they did hold on. It's the only Mercedes star left on the car, obviously, than the emblem at the front on the nose, etc. But it is definitely there, the red one. They have kept that on there. I think that was a feature that last season a lot of people were very happy about with all the stars, and you had the red one. Yeah, that, that was nice. Out stood out for Nikki, uh, but they still have that red star on the car. So um, yeah, have a look and definitely check that out. Cause it's definitely still there. Um, AMG. Yeah. Has to be the most noticeable part of the car. Obviously, you know, Mercedes AMG formula one in the name AMG, very much prominent this season on the back of the car. I mean, it's something different. I'll be honest with you. I, I, you know, it would have been very, very difficult to top last year's livery. I think it's fair to yeah. say it was the best livery of anybody's, um, and this season, it was always going to be hard. It, even if they kept it the same, people probably would have complained, oh, boring, try something different. They've done that. It's still nice. Probably not as good. The silver was always going to creep back into the car in one way or another. And I imagine it will probably be all over the car next season. It'll be completely silver because they are the silver arrows. And whilst it is important to show support for a, a very much a worthy cause, um, you know, Mercedes are a silver arrows team, and I'm sure they'll return to that in due course. But, you know, the car itself looks great in general. Uh, the, Mercedes were always going to be the team where everybody was going to be looking at with a magnifying glass to try and see not only if there were any sort of new innovative pieces on the car that they could perhaps learn from or see if they what route they've gone down, but also how they've managed to handle this homologation of the rules, if you like, moving a lot of 2020 parts into 2021. And of course, how they would be able to maintain the performance levels that they had or the advantage that they had last season into 2021, given that because of the aerodynamic changes, being the best team with the best car from last season, you tend to stand to be the team with the most to lose. So it's important how to, to see how they're able to sort of claw any of that back. Um, Lee, I'll come to you first. Was there anything in particular that stood out on the car from a technical perspective? I know you mentioned a few pieces already, but was there anything that stood out to you that sort of intrigued your technical interest at Mercedes? Uh, looking at the car, and really, I, there's nothing that stands out to me that goes, oh, that looks interesting, or well, that could be different. But what I find interesting is, as a team, it, they haven't announced what they spend their tokens on, where other teams have willingly said what they spent the tokens on, what they're focused on, but Mercedes have not said at all what they've done, which then piques my interest because, uh, okay, they're not, it's not something that may not be easily noticeable. It could be strikingly noticeable when they do a shakedown one, which I presume they will do. Um, so, yeah, um, that's what intrigues me the most about their release. Yeah, I mean, I saw uh, an enlarged brake duct at the front of the car. Now, I believe from what I've read that has to do with uh, generating more of an outwash through the tires um, and the tire shape has changed a little bit on the inside to kind of work with that to give it more of an aerodynamic benefit mostly when following other cars which is always a good thing um, and obviously when cars are following them as I imagine Mercedes will be hoping to do more than following others um, it will give them more of an aero benefit in that regard as well so that was one thing I did notice at the bottom it sort of expanded the brake ducts in the photos um, 
as I said, you know, there are some other things that we'll talk about that Mercedes have kind of kept close to their chest. Uh, the suspension, I heard that they changed a few little bits on there, um, but it's mostly inside the nose structure. So stuff we can't actually see, but judging by the shape on the outside, it looks like they've gone that way. There was a nice bulge on the engine cover. I don't know if either of you had seen this. There was a like a, a bubble bulge on the engine cover that on the left-hand side of the car, I believe it was, that James Allison was talking about. Now, this is regarding the engine performance changes that they were chasing uh, for this season. Last season, particularly at Abu Dhabi with the MG UK, there were some reliability issues on the car. And this was one of the reasons why Red Bull really done well in Abu Dhabi. Mercedes just couldn't keep up with them. They just didn't want to push the car so hard because they were concerned about the reliability. So they've spent a lot of their time, or HPP, Mercedes engine partners, have spent a lot of time working on that over the winter, chasing more performance, redesigning the engine to some degree to facilitate this. And as a result, this little bulge on that left side is to sort of coincide with the design so that it fits in with the car. So it's not for an aerodynamic benefit. If anything, it's probably done with that in mind so that it doesn't mitigate the aerodynamic performance at the rear of the car, because um, the, obviously the engine parts around that, that are sort of, um, sort of like parallel to that or adjacent to that, I should say, it's all sort of sloped down all the way from the side pods to the engine cover, all the way down to funnel that air as much as possible through to the Coke bottle area and diffuser to maximize as much suction underneath the car and downforce as possible. That's one of the things I've seen in the Mercedes that have stood out to me. And it looks really, really good. I think of all the teams so far that have done that, McLaren have gone a similar way on this for obvious reasons with the new Mercedes engine. But Mercedes have gone even more extreme than everyone else. Uh, and it's something that you see often on the Mercedes cars. They've been doing it for a few years and it looks really, really good. So I think at the rear end of the car, at the rear end of the car, I should say, where Mercedes are pretty strong, this is one of the areas that I think they've done very well at. But uh, looking at the renders so far, of course, we'll have to wait and see what happens on the track, but it looks good. Um, Courtney, was there anything in particular that sort of intrigued your interest or something that you saw that might be of interest? I was more interested in what James Addison had to say. You know, you've all, you both already said about how they were hiding, particularly um, the bottom side of the car, because let's not forget with these changes and regulations, the floor has been probably seen the biggest changes. So any sort of loopholes they can find, that's where the biggest advantage could likely be this season. And um, James Addison was very keen to stress that. So I kind of share the same curiosity that Lee does with concerns to what they're hiding is it's going into the season well usually it is like this we're more intrigued about what we can't see rather than what we can see but I, I don't know I I sense a lot of cautious optimism with Mercedes they have every right to be given how much they dominated but I don't know just given the rhetoric coming from both Alison and Wolf I sense they're pretty confident about this season for Mercedes I mean, I've said this before. I could listen to James Allison talk about Formula One cars all day long. There's just something about him that, you know, and this is coming from a Ferrari fan as well. When James Allison was working at Ferrari, he seemed so much happier at Mercedes than he was at Ferrari. Obviously, it coincided with a difficult period in his life, hence the motivation to move to Mercedes. You know, it wasn't unharmonious at Ferrari by any stretch, but it's just so nice to see James Allison, you know, looking so upbeat and looking so positive and, when he talks about Formula One car, as I said, like Adrian Newey, you could sit down there with a the notepad and just literally listen for hours and hours on end without ever losing interest at all. It's fantastic. But, you know, James Allison standing aside. Um, you're right, guys. You know, he talked about the floor of the car. And this is the area in particular I'm most intrigued by as well for 2021, because this is the area where you tend to see teams gain and lose performance in equal measure, but by quite some margin, you could find half a second in small adjustments to the floor so easily. And teams tend to focus on that for, uh, along with the chassis in terms of building the car around that. This season, of course, as you've both mentioned, the rear of the car has been chopped uh, by some amount. And as a result, teams have had to claw back that performance. And it's quite a lot they're going to have to refine. The fact that Mercedes have covered up the, the, the floor with the little covers on either side that we saw during the unveiling, in a way that Red Bull have to some degree as well. It, it does trigger interest in the same way that Das did when we saw that in pre-season testing. I mean, Das was the big talking point last year, and we probably will never know, even this season, you know, without having it, we'll never know how important it was for Mercedes unless they actually tell us. 
which I don't think they will, um, could could it come down to the team that does the best job with the floor in terms of who makes the biggest jump in performance this season? Um, Lee, I'll come to you first. Yeah, I would would say that is, the floor is going to be the important thing. Obviously, all the um, aerodynamicists are going to be working to recover as much, recovering as much downforce as they can before the season starts, and especially as the season goes on. They're going to keep clawing that back. That I wouldn't be surprised by the end of the year that the cars are near enough got close to the levels of downforce they had last year because mm. uh, they'll just find some workaways that work with the new regulations. Um, but it's the, the the floor is such an important area, as you said, where it sucks down in the car and generates most of the downforce. Uh, it's just really interesting on how the Mercedes are going to go about it because you think that. I can't remember when they stopped development last year's car, but it was a lot earlier than the other teams did. I think it was the summer was, break, wasn't it? Yeah, well, yeah. there wasn't a summer break. <laughs> <laughs> well, obviously, yeah, yeah. Around, around about when they would have had the summer yeah. break rather than when they did. Um, yeah, But they, because in that sense, they've had most time to develop and adapt their car to the new regulations because they stopped a lot earlier than most of the other teams, especially at the front end of the field. Um. So I wouldn't be surprised that, that they've probably aced the, the new regulations more, more than the other team. Well, it's always an expectation with the best car. You're obviously doing work on it. Obviously, you've got the best people, the best team, the everything else that Mercedes has, which has made them what they are. I mean, it's by no fluke that they've won seven world championships and constructors championships in a row. So you'd expect them to be in the best place to take advantage of it. Um, I mean, James Allison was talking about uh, certain parts of the car underneath that obviously they were covering up, not only just for performance, but to make sure that they were sustainable, i.e. they didn't damage so easily, they were more durable so that they wouldn't have to replace them as often, which of course has a cost benefit, which bear in mind, they have to meet a cost cap of 147 Point four million pounds this year in contrast, or dollars I should say, in contrast to where they were last season, where they were probably spending more than double that. Um, but I digress. It's something I think that we are going to be very intrigued to see how it works out on track. Everyone's going to be out with their cameras looking at the new Mercedes to see what secrets they have on their floor. And as I said, there's no guarantee that it will work or at least another team may have done a better job. You know, we can't rule that out, but it's certainly one that intrigues the mind. And I'm certainly looking forward to seeing what Mercedes have tucked in literally under their sleeves of the car. Um, Let's talk about the drivers. Um, Lewis Hamilton, Valtteri Bottas. Lewis, for a long time, it was a case of will he, won't he, in terms of his future at Mercedes. Eventually, that all culminated in him signing a one-year deal. Um, as I said, there's no confirmation that he has an option to stay on for another year if he wants to. So we should assume at this point that this could potentially be his last season in Formula One. Um, Courtney, I'll come to you first. Lewis Hamilton already now has achieved more than any other driver in the sport. Only one huge record is left for him to break, which is the, the uh, World Championships record, which he holds with Michael Schumacher. He can now stand alone with eight World Championships. With everything that's been going on over the winter break for Lewis Hamilton, you know, we'll put the contract stuff to bed because we've talked enough on that. Where are his priorities this year? Is this the season? Is this the finale to his long Formula One career and he wants to end it in the best way possible with a world championship? Or, you know, it, is it perhaps with a view that this is perhaps a stepping stone to something a bit more than that beyond 2021? Yeah, there's no doubt in his commitment to winning races and obviously giving his best for Mercedes and going on to win a championship. But even given by the interview that he gave today, there's definitely a sense of his mindset sort of focusing more on the social issues that he's been very vocal about um, in the past year or so. Um, you know, they've already started the initiatives with bringing um, students from um, diverse backgrounds into Formula One. And I, I don't know, at this point in time, maybe events would change if you feel see where Mercedes are in 2022 how they get on this season. These are factors that need to be considered. But I just sense a, a shift in priority. I can see if all goes well for Lewis, it could well um, retire at the end of the season. And then we'll probably see him take on an ambassadorial role, primarily with Mercedes. And then with the very top people, Formula One would be a representative for the sort of initiatives he wants to bring into the sport. So it wouldn't surprise me. It wouldn't be a shock if he was to retire at the end of the season, 
But I, I think, you know, I think a lot of people love to see him hang around, particularly uh, British fans. But um, I'm sure I'm sure fans of other teams are, are sort of sick of him dominating and probably want to see someone else um, sort of take over. So I think there'll be some fans that will sort of be keeping their fingers crossed that he retires. And uh, Lee, I'll, I'll probably put that question to you. Just a reminder, um, what do you see as Lewis Hamilton's priorities being for the rest of his Formula 1 career? Do you feel that it's going to be the final gear that he signed up for for this year to win the eighth World Championship and then move on to projects which he calls bigger than sport or Formula 1? Or do you feel that this is just um, you know, a year to just sort of see how things go and perhaps looking towards the future in Formula 1 and perhaps sticking around for a bit longer? Well, from... At least how I took the the interview with Lewis is where he said like he wanted a one year deal, which surprised me because that doesn't sound at least in my, how I perceive Lewis that he wanted a one year deal. So I think that's more of a team PR speech than you know, how Lewis actually feels. Um, so I think it's very much a holding pattern year for Lewis, and very much see how this year goes see how the team goes behind closed doors regarding the obviously the regulation change for 2022. Um, and obviously he's the, the Black Lives Matter and the obviously the programs with Formula One are, are very important to him and close to his heart. Um, so I wouldn't see be surprised as he, he becomes more vocal and probably probably upsets the FIA in some aspects because he's done something that are uh, outside the FIA regulations mm. that by the shirt, t-shirt wearing he wore last year that the FA weren't too happy with. Um, so I'm, I'm sure it's going to be important to him. And the ambassador role, I think, is the long-term plan, but I personally hope that it's not next year, <laughs> at least a couple of years away. Yeah, I, I think we kind of have to look at the Lewis Hamilton situation as whether or not he decides to call it a day at the end of the season, regardless of what he does. And part of me feels like perhaps he's given himself that opportunity to win an eighth world title. And perhaps if he does do that, retire at the top, having won more than anyone else, the undisputed greatest of all time, from a statistics perspective, at least anyway, although he is already there. Um, it seems that there's a lot on his mind regarding the humanitarian efforts, uh, as we've already discussed, and the environmental ones as well. And, you know, Formula One is a sport, you know, they were championing the We Races One campaign and Black Lives Matter and anti-racism, everything else that they were doing, everything. But there were occasions, as you mentioned, Lee, last season at Magello, where Lewis Hamilton, very much, very brave, sporting the shirt uh, regarding Breonna Taylor and... The FIA originally weren't happy about that. And then, of course, the backlash caused them to change their minds on the situation uh, regarding the protocol or the, you know, the belief protocol. And then, it, it, you know, it goes further than that. And perhaps incidents that we've seen in the last few months regarding one particular driver as well that we're, you know, we're not going to talk about until the Haas episode. Um, it does raise some level of doubt as to whether or not the FIA and F1 are actually taking these matters seriously. And perhaps Lewis Hamilton as an ambassador for this and an activist for it as well, perhaps may feel that he needs to be more directly involved rather than doing that and being a driver. As I said, I'm just speculating here. I have no idea where Lewis's mind is at with this, but it's become more apparent in the last few years. As brilliant as he has been as a driver, he's been juggling both the activist and the Formula One driver role on top of the plethora of other responsibilities that he has. And after a certain amount of time, I'm not surprised that his mind might be, you know, more focused on more important projects than just his day-to-day -day job. But uh, I digress. Um, th let's move on to Valtteri Bottas, a driver who has a very big season in front of him, a driver that has been for the last few years operating on the basis that he does not know whether or not he will be with the team next year. And in fairness to Valtteri, more often than not, has thrived under the pressure. He doesn't seem to bulk under it in the same way that other drivers may, despite the overwhelming competition that he has for that seat, not just in his own team, but those that want that seat instead of him. Are we going to see a Valtteri Bottas 3 or 4.0 or a better version of the previous Valtteri Bottas's that we've seen? Or do you feel that perhaps this is going to be the same old story and perhaps this year, more than the others, the axe will finally drop and Mercedes will look elsewhere? 
Um, where how do you see this going for Bottas this year? Courtney, I will come to you first on this one. Um, for not only one, but two reasons. This guy needs to be on top of his game, not only to cement his place in a team with George Russell waiting, because I think George Russell will be joining wherever Lewis stays or goes in 2022. So the rest explains itself there. But also, let's not forget, if Red Bull closer this year, they've got a more than competent pairing in um, the Zappen and Perez. I think we discussed it in last episode. I think I reckon Perez is going to be a very good driver for Red Bull. So, if Mercedes want to win this constructors championship and Red Bull being close, they need Bottas to be on top of his game in order to compete with them. So, I think similar to a couple of other drivers like Giovinazzi and Ocon, for example, I think this seat, I think this season could define the rest of Bottas's career. Mm. Quite possibly so. Um, Lee, how about you? How, where do you stand on Valtteri Bottas's situation? Because um, as we've mentioned already, the spotlight has been primarily on Lewis and we've completely ignored the fact that Valtteri Bottas is in some regards a similar position over his future. He doesn't know whether he's going to be there or not in 2022. Although unlike Lewis, perhaps it's a lot more out of his control um, regardless of performance. He has to step up this year. Where do you see Valtteri Bottas uh, going this year? Well, I, I do agree it's a key year for Valtteri. Um, the only way I potentially ever, I see him staying in Mercedes for 2022 is if he's world champion. Um, other than that, I agree with Courtney that I see George Russell being there next year, regardless if Lewis stays or not. Um, but it is a key season beyond that, apart from if he, even if he isn't world champion is that he's got to display that why he should stay in Formula 1 and put himself on the shelf, so to speak, to the other teams. Because if as if we're right, that could I call him, call him myself, say George is going to Mercedes and Lewis does stay, but he's not going to want to retire. So he, he, wants to, he will need to find another drive. Um, and Barrettery is a good calibre driver, uh, unlike some other drivers mm-hmm. who seem to get worse over seasons and don't improve. Valtteri has proven that he can get better season on season. But I don't think he's the kind of calibre that can take that fight to Lewis in the kind of regard that uh, Verstappen uh, could, or even Rosberg did. Um, Valtteri's proven that he's very quick in qualifying and can, can take Lewis to the to the wire in qualifying. But in the race, he doesn't have that race craft and the, the overtaking and the finesse that requires a season-long championship battle against a caliber a driver of Lewis's caliber mm. or even Red Bull in with Max and so that that's where I, I see uh, Valtteri going yeah I mean Valtteri has to have high expectations of him in order to keep that seat in Mercedes I'm sort of leaning towards the idea that based on what we've seen the last few seasons if Valtteri is able to not just give Lewis Hamilton a fair fight, in, well, a, a decent fight, I should say. He hasn't really done that over the course of the season whilst he's been Hamilton's teammate. But it always seems to be a pattern where as long as Valtteri does enough to keep Red Bull and in particular Max Verstappen in check, it's enough to convince Mercedes, well, Valtteri is comfortably ahead of everybody else. So if Lewis goes by proxy of, but you know, by, by process of elimination, Valtteri should be the best guy on the grid. Of course, the Sakir Grand Prix last season didn't do Valtteri any favours when George Russell stepped in on his debut for Mercedes and had that race won. If it were not for the issues in that race that profounded George, he would have beaten Valtteri or ends up. And I think that lay, leaves a sea of doubt in Mercedes' mind and perhaps that Valtteri is not the guy to take Mercedes forward in the future and perhaps George would be the best option going forward. But they have two seats. Also, Adam... Yeah. Also, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but isn't George Russell out of contract with Mercedes at the end of this season? If that's the case, that puts extra pressure on Mercedes to take George on, or he could end up joining another team. He's under the Mercedes programme, and yes, you're right, he does have that contract till the end of 2022. As of right now, his future currently lies with Williams, but you're absolutely right to point that out, because I think George has no intention to go to another team. However... In the case of Mercedes, with 2022 looming, the pecking order could change in so many ways. So for George, it's almost a case of 
try and experiment maybe with the other teams like Red Bull, Ferrari, perhaps McLaren or other teams as well. Not suggesting that those are realistic options, but if you're a driver of that caliber and those teams are sniffing around looking at a talent like George Russell, it may be of interest to them to try and incentivize George to leave Mercedes because even if he goes to Mercedes in 2022, there's no guarantee with the regulations changing and the cost cap being equalized and everything else that Mercedes are going to do the best job as they've done for the last seven or eight years. So yeah, there is an element of doubt where I think Mercedes may be more incentivized to just give George what he wants early and commit his future to the team longer term, rather than waiting to see how things pan out for Valtteri and of course, Lewis Hamilton as well. So that's a really good point, Courtney. I definitely think it's worth noting that. Um, you know, it's it's almost like three into two. It just doesn't go. But you'd almost feel that Mercedes may have two seats available rather than one. It may not be George and Valtteri. George may have a they may have a brand new driver lineup in twenty twenty two. Um, I'd be surprised given that Mercedes really much champion consistency and patience and longevity over the short term gains. But given how crazy Formula One can be, you certainly can't rule it out. Um, let's go for the final part of the episode, guys. Um, I know we all spoke about Mercedes in our predictions video and, you know, I teased the idea that because of the regulation changes this year and Mercedes may have more to lose that there might be a window for Red Bull to catch them. Having looked at this car and seen what I've seen on the Red Bull, as I said, I'm no way an expert on aerodynamics, but from what I've seen, Mercedes look like they might have done a better job at the rear end of the car than what Red Bull have done, considering that Red Bull are pretty much stuck to what they did last year and optimised it as best they can. A lot will depend on the engine performance, but are we looking at the world champions for 2021? Um, and if not, do you feel there's anyone that can stop them? Um, Courtney, I'll come to you first on this one. Um, I'd, I'd, be, uh, I'd be foolish to bet against Mercedes winning this championship, given how well they've adapted to these small regulation changes in the past. Um, but also, it depends mainly on what Red Bull do. You know, they, they've got a good driver partnership. Honda seemed bullish about their engine performance. They, they did well towards the end of the season. So if anyone is going to challenge them, it would be um, it would be Red Bull. But quite interesting, I'll put a little poll out on Instagram and I asked whether Mercedes would be um, challenged. And it was uh, straight through the middle, 50-50. So there seems to be a degree of uncertainty about this year. I, I think a lot of it depends on what Red Bull have done. It's so hard to tell because naturally, you know, in other sports where, you know, things don't change too much from one season to another other than a few new signings here or there. But it's a lot more easy to predict which teams are going to be at the very front. Of course, in Formula One, it is fairly easy this season. We expect Mercedes and Red Bull to be the protagonists again. Ferrari have probably got too much to claw back for this season. Um but it's so hard to tell at this point, especially with the change in the regulations in the manner that would probably suit Red Bull more than Mercedes to really determine if Mercedes are going to have a strong season again and Red Bull are going to struggle. I, I don't think Mercedes will struggle. I think they'll be the team to beat. It's a case of where Red Bull will be in that picture. Um, Lee, I'll put that question to you as well. Um, is it going to be another season like 2020 for Mercedes or do you feel Red Bull are going to be in the mix with them this season? Uh, I would say that I reckon Lewis will be champion and Mercedes will be champion. But unlike last year, it will be a lot closer battle. Mercedes won't disappear into the Constructors Championship and go off 100, 200 points clear, whatever it was at the end of the season. It'll be a lot closer battle. Um, it, we may actually get a season where Lewis ends up with less than 10 race wins. Um, he probably still reached 10 race 10 race wins, it'll probably be more Valtteri that loses out on the race wins if Red Bull are sniffing. Um, yeah, but that, that's how I see the this season going for Mercedes. Mm. I mean, it's going to be more predictable in terms of the venues that we're going to, as far as we're aware at the moment, given uh, compared to what we had last year. Um, I, mean, I mean, despite Mercedes' dominance, we never, it, it wasn't as dominant as uh, it was in previous seasons. I remember 2016 that they, I think they won 90% of the races that season, which is incredible. And it was the height of their dominance in that, in the era. Um, whether that continues this year, we'll have to wait and see. As I said, it's so hard to tell, even though we have a pretty good idea where the pecking order is and who's going to be where and who's not going to be there. 
it's so hard to tell until the cars go out for pre-season testing. And even then, we may have to wait till Bahrain. Um, Mercedes are very much the kings of portraying themselves as the underdogs, or at least portraying themselves in a position where they don't feel confident that they're going to be winning race after race. They really do work as if they are the uh, contender rather than the defending champion, which is quite nice to see, but you almost feel that there's got to be some level of expectation. Nonetheless, guys, of course, let us know what you think of the new Mercedes. Do you like the livery? Um, are you a fan of this one compared to last year's or not? Where do you feel that Mercedes will fare? Of course, they look like the team to beat, but will it be as straightforward as it has been in previous years? Let us know what you think. And of course, guys, make sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel. Thank you, of course, Lee, once again for joining us on this episode. And uh, I'm sure you'll be with us for a few more car reveals before the week is done. And uh, Courtney, of course, thank you for hosting this with me as well. And guys, one last plug before we go. Make sure, if you haven't already, the DNF1 F1 podcast for the month of March is being sponsored by Manscaped and uh, some great products that they have on offer on their website that we've tried and tested ourselves and we absolutely love them. And we know you guys will as well. Make sure to use code DNF1 on the website to get 20% off and free shipping. That's manscaped.com. So until then, guys, thank you very, very much for tuning in. Stay safe, and we will see you in the next episode of the DNF1 F1 podcast. Take care. See you soon.